Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Take Another Look, we are, where we are teaching the book of Revelation verse by verse, and I'm sharing with you what I believe the Holy Spirit has shown me. So we welcome everyone this morning, and I know that some of you are coming on now. Some of you will come on later, but uh, this video will be available to everyone uh, through after we finish the broadcast. It takes about an hour to download it. Uh, and to upload it to YouTube and it will be ready and shared. So we're glad you joined us today. Now, in this ongoing series, uh, if you're joining me for the first time, we're looking at the events surrounding the Apostle John as he experiences the heavenly realms. And we're seeing what we can learn from this. Just keep in mind that I'm teaching this completely from the idea that this is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so as we look at the book of Revelation today, we're looking at the revelation of Jesus, the revelation that Jesus shared with John. And as John had this heavenly encounter, then he begins to write and uh, 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 put this down in words that uh, we uh, are, are gaining uh, an understanding of. Now, uh, this book is about, the, about truth unveiled. And what we're looking at in terms of revelation is the unveiling of the Father's heart. So there's some things that God wants us to see. And so I urge you to stick with me. And uh, listen, uh, for those that are watching this video, uh, whether live or after the fact, I want to just tell you that I urge you not to be a person who throws away valuable revelation simply because you believe things differently than I'm teaching only because someone told you one time that it was the truth. I simply ask you to consider what the scriptures are saying, along with the supporting evidence from the word of God. So let's get started today as we continue to see what John sees, what John hears, and what he shows us on how to operate in the heavenly realm while ministering here in this earthly realm. Really, they're not separate, but uh, we'll, we'll just leave it that way for now. Okay, so let's continue with Revelation 11. Today, we're talking about verses 7 through 10, and at least we'll break the ground on some of these and come back to a couple of these uh, next time. But this section, if you have a King James Version of the Bible or some of the study helps that you may use to re do research, what you will find is this section in verses 7 through 10 are called the witnesses killed. So it's a title that the translators gave to kind of help people know what's coming up. Whether it's accurate or not, that's what they're doing. And so uh, I'm, I'm not taking away from the whether it's accurate or not. We'll find that out in scripture. So let's start in verse number seven. And it says, when they finished their testimony, Revelation 11 verse seven, when they finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also out uh, our, or it should read their Lord was crucified. Uh, then arose from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will, then those from the peoples, tongues, tribes, nations, will see their dead bodies three and a half days. Three and a half days is symbolic of three and a half years. Um, and will not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, there's, there's a, a couple of things we want to notice here. First of all, if you were to relate this to events that take place in Israel, and you were to relate this as a natural event, uh, then uh, a lot of people do that. And we come up with a gospel that is doom and gloom, a gospel that is people are dying and all of these things. But if you look at this in the light of how the book of Revelation was written, then you're going to see something totally different. So again, I want to tell you, through, uh, through all the years of research and ministry uh, and time with the Lord, what I have discovered is, is that the book of Revelation 
is symbolic, number one. It has symbolic and spiritual meanings in it. This was not a literal writing that John did, a, a verbatim play-by-play -play of what Jesus told him. This is the revelation of what Jesus told him. Uh, so there, there is a difference. Now, also I want to say that not only is this book filled with symbolic and spiritual meanings, but also uh, it's the time frame in which this book was written. And we're going to be talking about that. So as we go into this today uh, and we get started, I don't want you to, now I want to ask you if you can open your mind, open your heart to, to see that this book is more than just um, uh, a, a message about destruction. There is something going on here. And if you've been following my lessons, Last uh, week, we had almost uh, about around 900 viewers. And if you've been following my lessons, you'll be able to flow into this. So let's remember the power of the two witnesses, okay, which is the word and the spirit, or we could say the message and the messenger, which is what we've been finding out. There must be an inward agreement within you with the Lord's message of sonship. See, what we're finding out in the book of Revelation is this is not just a book about uh, uh, futuristic events. It's, it's actually not a book about futuristic events. It's about things that have already happened, but the manifestation of those things have not happened yet. The reason I say that is because this book was completed in its writing. The Lord had spoken these things, and John saying, here's what I see, here's what's going on, and it was completed about 66 to 68 AD, and then AD 70, the destruction of Jerusalem takes place, the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem more specifically, the end of temple worship, the end of animal sacrifices, the end of a, a what was uh, intended to be a world religion, at least at that time. So we have the land of the Bible, which was the world, and sometimes even spoke of the age, and the age is what has come to an end. So now, as we look at this, what does all of this mean? Because the book of Revelation really is about sonship. The book of Revelation is not about destruction. If you followed me from day one, we're now in lesson 81. This is about sonship. This is about what the Lord is doing in a people, those who will yield to and submit to his dealings and his workings. So the Lord by the Holy Spirit is doing a great work within a people who were not a people, but are now the people of God. And, um, you know, when I say who were not a people, that means prior to the cross and who are, are now the people of God is after the cross, even though all men have not come into the knowledge of the truth. So now that we've seen God empower these two witnesses talking about the book of Revelation, we're not talking about futuristic things. We showed you last week that Elijah and, and Moses were not the two witnesses, uh, even though they're symbolically mentioned from the original translation now into the English translation. We need to understand that these two witnesses are the word and the messenger, the message and the messenger. And uh, we'll talk about that some more today. Now, in verse 7, Revelation 7, verse uh, 11, verse 7, says when they finished their testimony, when they finished doing what they were assigned to do, the Bible says the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Here's what we want to understand. If the reality was this was a literal thing, okay, and there was an enemy, a beast, and was going to stop the testimony of God in those two witnesses, if this were a literal thing, then what you would find is, is that they would not be able to finish their testimony, but they would stop them before the word got to the people, if it were literal, okay? So we really have a conflict here. The reality is, once the word was finished, the testimony was done, the completion of the message and the messenger, a beast sends out of the bottomless pit. We want to ask ourselves, what bottomless pit? And makes war on them, to overcome them, to kill them. That's stating the intention. That's not stating fact. His intention is to make war on them, overcome them, and kill them. So what is he talking about? Well, first of all, the Greek word translated as testimony uh, is the word martyria, which means to give evidence or make a report or testimony. The Greek word translated as kill or kill is the word opportuno. Uh, sounds like our English word opportunity. Opportino, 
and uh, and one of its meanings is to destroy. So it's evident that even from the original language that something is intended to be destroyed. Uh, there will be things in life which can pressure you if you haven't noticed that already. And the pressure is designed for a specific purpose, which is to change or to alter your testimony. You might be a longtime churchgoer. You might have a history of, of experience with God, but regardless of what your v particular venue is as far, far as church styles or preaching styles or, or the name under which you worship, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Charismatic, and etc. And what you'll find is, is you have established a testimony. This is where I stand. I have victory in Jesus Christ. I'm not moved. I'm going to be moved. However, what happens is pressure comes. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said these words, and, uh, and he said, in the world, you, I think it's John 16, 33. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's where it is. And he says, in the world, you will have tribulation. That word tribulation is translated literally as pressure. In the world, you will have pressure. Jesus says, in me, you will have peace. So in Jesus, this was a pre-cross statement. So in Jesus, he said, look, I'm about to manifest in a big way, and I am going to put peace in you. Who is peace? Peace is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is, I'm going to be in you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to live with you. Read the rest of John chapter 14. Read that whole chapter, and you'll find what he's talking about. Um, and so, uh, he, but he's saying, in the world, listen, there's going to be pressure. And so the pressure comes to try and alter your testimony. You can say, yeah, the old devil. Well, we're going to get to that in chapter 12. But the reality is, is before you go doing the blame game, the devil, Satan, trying to put off everything on something else, you need to understand that whatever the enemy is, it was destroyed and defeated at the cross. Number two, we need to realize that in life, okay, just living life, pressure comes. And the reality is, is that that pressure has a mission. That pressure is designed to destroy or change or alter your testimony. It's just like sickness has a mission. Sickness is an entity against the human body, and the entity, is the, the intention uh, or the purpose of sickness is to, uh, to destroy your quality of life and ultimately bring death. Well, the same thing here. Now, so we want to talk about our testimony. We want to talk about the words that come out of our mouth in this lesson today. And God says in Psalm 89, verse 34, my covenant I will not break, nor alter the words that has gone out of my lips. This is why our the message, our message of the Lamb's life in us must remain the same. Now, I've talked in the past about the book of the Lamb's life, and we'll talk about that more in the future. But the book of the but the, but the book of life is actually translated the book of the Lamb's life. What is he talking about? What book? He is the book, and he's in you, and he invites you to eat that book. And we we talked about that. But what we want to understand here is that the revelation of Christ manifests in you, and when that happens, then the message must remain one with the messenger. In other words, if today I say I am victorious because of what Jesus did, it's not about me, it's about him. It's what he did. I am I am an overcomer because he overcame. Nothing can separate me from his love. If that's my position today, but tomorrow great opposition comes, what's my testimony then? Because if I have truly become one with the message, if the message and the messenger is one, my testimony will not be altered under pressure. Are you hearing me today? So we've come so far in this message that it's too far, too long to ever turn back to the old. So why is the beast ascending or rising up out of the bottomless pit to come against these witnesses? I want you to think about this. When we talk about the witnesses, we're not talking about two people, okay? We're not talking about two people. We're talking about Something that happens in you, becoming one with the message so that your testimony never becomes altered. Uh, first of all, it's because the witnesses have finished their testimony. In other words, when the message and the messenger become one, their testimony becomes the final word. Are you hearing me? So when I declare I'm victorious today, I'm not declaring it based on my own uh, uh, doings or my own uh, uh, 
uh, declaration just to be saying something. I'm doing it based on the declaration of Jesus. When I say I'm not the sick trying to get healed, I'm the healed because God said so. I'm not doing it because that because uh, of something I came up with. I'm doing it because of what God said. So the reality is, is that my testimony now, my the message and the messenger in me have become one so that my testimony does not become altered. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 4 through 6 says where the word of the king is there's power and who may say to him what are you doing he who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful and a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment because for every matter there is a time and judgment though the misery of man increases greatly now let me just say this to you that the misery of man uh, some people want to quote the scriptures that says that man's days are long and full of, of of misery and they'll do that and here's what i want to say uh the reality is um the reality is is that that there are pressures or there are troubles in life okay that happens out there, let's just say out here, I'm in my office today at home, and out there, there's a bunch of junk going on in the world. People want to know, why is there trouble in the world? Why are there events that's happening in the world? Why is there bad things happening in the world? Out there, there's pressure, okay? But what's going on in here? In here, there's peace. Why is there peace in here? I've come to embrace the fact that Jesus is the person of peace and Jesus lives in me and that nothing in here can be disturbed by what's going on out there. When I say out here, you're seeing me put my hand over here. My window is there and uh, outside is that way. So nothing can disturb the peace in here. The message and the messenger have become one. I'm not telling you that I've learned it all. I'm not telling you that I've attained to to uh, everything i'm telling you that there are some things that are established in me just like there are some things established in you that cannot be altered just because things don't go right in your life you see sons of god operate as kings of the lord's kingly priesthood the priestly kingdom of god which is already in us he told his disciples the kingdom of god is within you so even today while we're still in the process of learning we must think like kings, act like kings, and speak like kings. We are the kings of his kingdom. I'm going to give you a couple of portions of scripture here in a moment, but here's what I want to say to you. Just because bad things are going on around you, wherever you're watching me from today, just because they exist does not mean that God has altered one word that's come out of his mouth it doesn't mean that God has altered one thing that he has done. So you discover those truths and then you become one with that message. The messenger and the message must become one and that and that cannot be altered or must not be altered. All right. Second Corinthians 1 verse 20 or 22 says, For the promises of God in him are yes and in him. Amen. To the glory of God through us works through us. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22 in the Amplified Bible says, it is he who has put his, also put his seal on us, that is, he has appro appropriated us and certified us as his and given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a pledge, like a security deposit to guarantee the fulfillment of the promise of eternal life. The question would be, when do you have eternal life? I am in eternal life. You see, as a natural being, people see themselves as limited. They see themselves as not having eternal life. As a supernatural being, okay, you are an eternal being also because you are in the eternal one. Amen. And so we need to start looking at life differently. We need to see life from the perspective of God's heart and not the perspective of a natural perception because God's promises are yes and amen and, uh, and a so be it so that we can be one with a never changing message. Now, note this. 
Some believe that God removed the hedge of protection so that the beast could attack sons of God in this process. However, uh, let's see once again what the beast actually represents. Now, uh, you may not like what I'm about to say and I'm about to read, but hang tight because this message is not over. Uh, writer and commentator J. Preston Eby said, you may notice that although the beast has never been mentioned in the book of Revelation before, yet the plain pre 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 uh, presupposition is that he is well known by those who read with understanding. It is the beast. And while the beast is not mentioned before, the bottomless pit, bottomless pit from whence he arises is mentioned in chapter 9. There. Uh, is it, it is a great smoke of a fiery furnace that is ascending out of the pit. It is my conviction that the beast is the bestial nature right within man, the carnal mind, the fleshly nature, which, uh, which ever seeks to uh, usurp the place of the spirit and the word and thwart the purpose of God. So the spirit and the word must be one. The message and the messenger must be one. The Lord uncovers within his children every trace of the remaining mindset or thought patterns of the old man of sin who arises out of the abyss of or out of the remaining soulish emotions of God's sons. Now, listen to this. Emotions are not bad in and of themselves, okay? Nothing wrong with emotions. I mean, if you go to church and you're worshiping and you get excited, nothing wrong with emotions. Uh, it's Christmas morning. Uh, family comes in. Nothing wrong with emotions. Uh, something happens in life and it causes you, brings you to tears. Nothing wrong with emotions. The emotions I'm talking about are the things that are said and done in life that do not agree with the heart of God. All right. Uh, we need to understand that this revelation is real. And so the Lord uncovers that. Uh, so uh, here's the thing. Uh, again, emotions are not bad in and of themselves, but only when they are not renewed to truth can they become a problem in us. All soulish ties to any religious mindsets of carnality must be dealt with. This is, does this begin to make sense for you? Are you beginning to see this passage of Revelation 11, verse 7 through 10? What's going on there? Well, here's the thing. Some believe that we still carry within us the curse of the old Adamic nature rolling around somewhere inside. Now, that's not a scriptural uh, reality. That's just a, a religious reality, a man-made religious thing. The, the, the truth is when the Bible says that the first Adam was replaced by the second Adam, the second Adam being Christ, uh, also, Paul calls him the last Adam. It was at that point when Christ came and Christ suffered and died. It was at that point where the reality is, is that that old nature of Adam died also. So you say, Dr. Bill, what do we have? What is going on? What we have is a years of religion preaching to us about this Adamic nature. And so we have the residual mindset or memories of this old nature, and we think that the truth is, we just think that we're still engulfed in this in this uh, religious mindset. The truth is, uh, the the Bible says something different. Listen to this: Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now I know these are common scriptures, and we've heard them before, and we know these verses. But sometimes we just need to be reminded. Uh, Paul says in Romans 6, verses 5 through 7, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Did you hear that? Our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. So we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Hallelujah. Well, Jesus showed the apostle John that the beast, uh, the beast was in reality making war uh, against the witness of the spirit and the word. The word, the anointing, the ministry, the hope, the expectation of these of the witnesses was what they declare. 
and we can expect that declaration to come to be. Now, when I say that, uh, listen, I am a finished works believer. What I believe is what Jesus did is final. It's done. It cannot be undone. The problem with it, uh, what, why I, I don't fully see that uh, it's done and that's the end of the story, is that we're still walking out that revelation. So it was done 2,000 years ago, roughly, give or take. And uh, and now here we are these years later. I believe it's uh, more than 2,000 years, but but here, here we are years later, and where are we? We're now getting the revelation of what Jesus actually finished. So it's already done, and it's not that it's being done in us per se, but we're getting the revelation of that, and that revelation causes an awakening to that truth so that we can operate in what Jesus did. You see, the reason that this is a, a, the overcoming word and the work of the Spirit is because symbolically they are bringing a killing to the beastly nature in mankind. So if you don't know the dealings of God, you don't know the workings of God, you need to awaken to truth because all things that are, are not of God must die in us so that everything that is of God might live in us to the full measure uh, as we live out uh, his life in this life. It's not just about this life. Notice this, uh, J. Preston Neby says, the bestial nature not only lurks in the heart of all mankind, but is also the controlling principle in all of man's religion. So the reality is there's things we do uh, that we don't like after we've done them, and that's because there's been all this beastly nature, all this stuff going on in us, uh, and uh, the, the reality is, is we need to understand that God has, has done a work in us by his spirit, and that work is manifesting in terms of uh, what God is doing. So uh, we need to be careful with that, okay? Just, just understand that God's doing a great work in you, amen, and uh, it's very important. Okay, now, uh, Isaiah 55, verses 9 through 11 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your, uh, my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. We should never become disheartened by the workings or the dealings of the Holy Spirit within us. Everything that is not in harmony with God is going to be worked out of you. The words Isaiah speaks here shows us that no word of the Lord will ever return back to him without bearing fruit. Listen, the word of the Lord is not upon the church per se. The word of the Lord is not upon preachers per se. The word of the Lord is upon all creation. God has this in hand. And, and the reality is, is that uh, uh, the words which come out of God's mouth will never fail. Look at Numbers 23, verse 19, if you're taking notes today. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. As has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? God's word always accomplishes everything he pleases and purposes. And the Bible says it prospers and is successful in the exact area he sends it to. What I'm saying is, is I believe that when God speaks a word over mankind, the reality is, I believe it's going to manifest. I believe it's going to come to pass. I don't know how he does it all. I don't know how he works everything in the people of this earth like he does, but the reality is he does. Amen. And so we need to be aware of that. Okay. Now, um, Psalm 103, verse 20, bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Here, angels are commissioned to carry out the words God speaks. When angels hear God speak, they carry out his words to the place he sends them. But angels are also known as ministering spirits. 
who also carry out our words. Does not Hebrews, I think it's uh, 1 verse 14, say that they are ministering spirits and they, they minister for those who are the heirs of salvation? Are you not an heir of salvation? Jesus has called the whole world to be heirs of his salvation. And so these angels, these ministering spirits, carry out our words. Angels or messengers from the Greek language are sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. And we have inherited our salvation, listen to this, when Jesus paid for it with his life. A few weeks ago, I had a minister friend of mine on Kingdom Dynamics on Thursday nights, and uh, Pastor Rory Sinegram, and he said, a man told him I got saved September whatever, 19 and whatever. And he said, the reality is that you got saved over 2,000 years ago when Jesus paid for your salvation. We need to think about that. Okay, Job 22, verse 28 from the Amplified Bible. You will also decide and create, create, decree a thing, and it will be established for you, and the light of God's favor will shine upon all your ways. This is why you can decree, decree something, and it will become established. Now, a lot of these words today we read from the Old Testament, and what they're prophesying is here's the thing that is true, and it's going to be in you, and there's, here's how that happens. And so the reality is, as God is saying, even in my new covenant, when my new covenant is established in you, the reality is you'll be able to speak or decree a thing, and that's exactly what will be established. It will become established because you got in agreement with God. The messenger and the message becomes one. The word and the spirit in you becomes one, and uh, now you de what you decree will become, uh, it will manifest in that exact manner. First in you, and then in the atmosphere around you. All right, let's look at, again, from the commentary from J. Preston Neby, writer and commentator J. Preston Neby, the great visitation of the Lord in 1948. This is so important for you to hear today, folks. Like all previous moves of God, was not a failure. It accomplished precisely what the Lord purposed and ordained, established in the earth, uh, the word of reconciliation, the great truth of sonship and the re living reality of the kingdom of God, which has uh, continued to bring forth harvest unto the ends of the earth. God never purposed to propagate or preserve and preserve the old order, the, the, the uh, order of that move, only to plant a seed in the field of the world, which would grow, change, and increase in due time, producing a vast harvest of sons of the kingdom. Oh, the wonder of it. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And now, some 70 years later, who can deny that his word has accomplished all that it is sent to do? All right. So from 1948, great revivals, great things happened. The reality is, as many things have been happened as of the fruit of those events. It's just like what you're doing right now. Okay, listen, one of the problems that people make about these moves of God is they camp there. And so I know people that, that for 30, 40, 50, 60 years are still in that same vein. No more revelation, uh, no increase anything because they're stuck in the rut of, of that move. Look, I want to tell you something. There's a move happening in you. It's not the same as it was yesterday. It's not the same as it was last week or even 20 years ago. The same revelation in you. God is trying to birth forth fresh revelation, new information, a new downloads of information. And so it's important that we become susceptible to the spirit and the word in you so that the spirit and the word, or in other words, the message of the messenger, those two witnesses become one in you. So now you become unmovable and stable in everything that God has spoken and you declare a thing and it manifests exactly as you decree it. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's look at verse seven again, but we'll add verse eight to it this time in our study as we move along. Thank you for hanging with me. All right, Revelation 11, verse 7 and 8. When they finished their testimony, the beast ascends out of the bottomless pit of the, the, uh, uh, the, the human nature, uh, of, of the, uh, uh, the, the nature of men, and will make war against them 
what? Make a war against who? The, the thing that you become established in. Overcome them and kill them. Now, again, this is not a, this is exactly what's going to happen. This is the idea of what the intention is. All right, verse 8. And their dead bodies will lie in the street. And the great city, which spiritual, uh, the great city, which is spiritual, called uh, spiritually called, not literally called, but spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord or their Lord was crucified. Okay, think about this. What about the slaying of these two witnesses? Some want to know if this is a past event or if this is yet to happen in the future. Well, here's the thing. Um, some also want to know, was this a physical or spiritual event? Well, it seems to me that the Holy Spirit is showing us the divine principle here, which has been manifested in the earth again and again and throughout the ages. This event is a specific fulfillment before us and in us as the kingdom of God arises within. Now, yes, the kingdom of God is in us. God, Jesus said that to his disciples. But what we don't know about the kingdom are the things that have not manifested yet in terms of the revelation of knowledge about what's already in us. Do I believe the finished work is in us? I believe the finished work is complete in you. I believe that everything that Jesus did, everything Jesus died to give you, everything Jesus died to do in you is done. I use the example with my coffee cup that in my coffee cup is coffee. You may not be able to see it because of this dense shield out here. You may not be able to see the finished work but the, but, or the coffee, but the coffee is definitely in there. The finished work of Jesus is in you. But as I tip the coffee cup up and take a drink, the manifestation, and I don't drink it all at one time because it's hot, okay? This mug here will keep my stuff hot five to six hours, uh, uh, all day long sometimes. But the reality is, is that I drink it up and I partake of some of the manifestation of what's already there. I don't get the full manifestation, uh, but I do get the manifestation. Well, the reality is, is that the finished work is in you. And so God has done something. So what's happening now? Well, as I as you partake of that finished work, what goes on is the things in you that are mindsets that are inaccurate, mindsets that are not uh, in line with the heart of God. The reality is, is those things begin to be burned out of you. It's kind of like drinking this hot coffee. Sometimes you can drink too much and something gets burned in you. Okay. Just like right now. Ooh, that's hot. So that's that's kind of an example there. Okay, now, over the years, every move of God has been sent for a specific purpose of planting the seed of God within the hearts of men and women. You say, but I've seen Pentecostal movements. I've seen Methodist movements. I've seen charismatic movements, and they're all different. Yes, because they're all able to speak to people in a different way. How about in the Catholic Church? The charismatic renewal that was born out of the Catholic Church when people would go into the fellowship halls and sing charismatic songs and the full gospel businessmen movement and all of those things. God was doing a certain thing in those who were in those those uh, those uh, those groups uh, that were susceptible to those groups. And God was doing a specific thing there so that he could get his message to those who were receptive in that uh, that arena. And so uh, it's important that we understand that that contained within the seed that God has been planting is the hidden embryo of life, which is uh, which contains the next thing God is going to do. Now, I want to say that again. I, I want to say that again. I want to say it clear because I want you to hear this. Contained within that seed, these moves of God, these things that God has been doing, even the things you've experienced yesterday, even the things you're going to experience yet today and, and tomorrow, the seed of God contained within that seed is the embryo, the hidden embryo of life, which contains the next thing God's going to do. Jesus says that the mystery is this. Reading from John chapter 14, verse 24, most assuredly I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, I want you to hear this, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So here's the thing. 
if the seed dies, it springs up and springs forth much fruit. When the seed dies, the outer form passes away, but the life is preserved and becomes manifest on a higher plane or a higher level. It always produces a much greater measure when the harvest comes. So we need to understand that the things that are going on in you now and the things that are being challenged in you and your belief systems are being challenged is the working of the Holy Spirit challenging those things so that everything in you comes into an agreement with the mind of God. Symbolically, the seed, capital S, is the living word of God. Jesus is the living word, which can never die, which can never be destroyed. The physical man was was crucified over 2,000 years ago, but Jesus himself, the supernatural son of the living God, can never die. So no matter what seems to be happening in you personally, or for the most part, what you may not even understand that's going on in you now, the beastly nature, the beast of the earthly nature remaining in us arises out of the pit of our humanity and makes war on what you think you believe. When there's that struggle, when that thing's going on in you and you're not sure if you believe this or you can embrace that, what is that? That's the struggle of, of this, this beastly nature saying you don't really believe that and attacking you and so to speak. And so, that, and, and so it's not a comfortable place, but it's a necessary place so that those things can die and that which remains can live. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That's the untamed emotions in us that have not been manifested with the knowledge of God. I want you to hear something. This is a piece of commentary from the voice translation of the Bible by Thomas Nelson and by the Ecclesia Bible Society. And hear what they have to say. This commentary of Revelation 11 verse 7 says, These two witnesses bear the striking resemblance to the faithful prophets of Israel. A striking resemblance doesn't say that they are. Uh, and the faithful martyrs of the churches. Together they stand speaking God's message to as the nations rant and rave and trample the holy city. The lampstands, which signify the churches, are, uh, are not the light, but they welcome the light and present it to the world. The olive tree, even today, is a symbol of Israel. It's not Israel, but a symbol of Israel. Uh, olive trees supply the oil for the lamps so that they may burn brightly in the darkness. For a season, the two witnesses enjoy God's protection, but, for, but a time is coming when they will fall victim to the nations and lie silent. Now, I don't fully agree with that commentary, but there was enough things in there that I wanted to show you so you can latch on to some truths. Just pull the truths out of that. The reality is, I don't believe there's a coming day. I believe the day has come and we're receiving the revelation uh, of that. Uh, revelation 11, verse 7 and 8, reading to you from the voice translation of the Bible. It says, on the day they finish their testimony, the beast from the abyss will declare war on them and win victory by killing them. Their dead bodies will lie in the streets uh, of the great city, which spiritually speaking is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. So. Here's the thing, man's thoughts are to always preserve himself from the outer experience, but the divine intention of God is for all of man's efforts to fall and to fail and fall to the ground and die. Man's efforts, our self-dependence, our self-reliance uh, on, on, on our own selves. Do, do you know why the law came in the Old Testament? So it's to show men that they needed something greater than themselves. They needed a savior. You know where we are today? Humanity is crying out saying, I don't understand why everything's going on, why there's all this evil in the world. Listen, here's the thing, folks. The reality is, is that God is saying, look, you're going to have to come to a realization that the only thing in you, the only thing that remains is your need for Christ. And you say, Dr. Bill, do you think the whole world will come to Christ uh, in one way or another? That's another teaching. I can't get into that right now. But the reality is so much going on there. So remember, verse 8 said, their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Uh, lastly, from commentator J. Preston Eby, he says, when the outer form is preserved, there can be no harvest. 
Seeds have been found in the tombs of Pharaoh and in Egypt and have lain there for 35 years, uh, 3,500 years. And during those long centuries, there was never a harvest from any of them. They were preserved for the wandering eyes of men in this our day. If the farmer does not cast his seeds into the earth, permitting the outer shell to decompose, there can be no increase. So John sees a prophetic picture of bodies lying in the streets, more so simply identifying with the death and burial of Jesus Christ. Think about that. Think about those things I just shared. See, this is what happened in each of us through Christ. Remember when you first came into an awareness, an encounter with Christ? What happened? A light came on. The light of love came on. You loved everybody. You forgave people that had wronged you in the past. Things began to change. But then a few weeks later, things got back to a norm for you. Did you know that that experience was supposed to continue over and over and over and over? That's right. So in Christ, each of us had a death occur relating to the death of Jesus so that a new thing would arise in us with a new move of God and a new day because the old order of things has died. When I say old order, people relate that to church. They relate that to the church service. They relate that to the Christian life. We're not talking about, we're talking about old religious mindsets. People often view death as a great tragedy, but in the wisdom of our heavenly father, he sees it as a great miracle in his creation. So whether or uh, you know it or not, the words of God will always come to pass just because they are words from God's own mouth. Amen. Okay, finally today, the city Jesus was crucified in was called what? Jerusalem, which took place somewhere around AD 30 to 36. Uh, we don't have an exam, not an expert with the Hebrew charts of the, the uh, old Hebrew uh, uh, calendars, but roughly 30 to 36. OK, the book of Revelation was completed about 68 to uh, 66 to 68 A.D. Now, our, our source says traditionally the book of Revelation has been dated near the end of the first century. Uh, one source, I mean around AD 96, okay? Some say that there's two two uh, lines of thought here, AD 68, AD 96. Some writers, however, have ad advanced the preterist view, uh, have uh, advanced the preterist view uh, from a Latin word meaning that which is past, contending that the apocalypse was pinned around AD 68 to 69. Why is that? Well, and thus, the thrust of the book is supposed to relate to the impending destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70. So everything you read in the Bible points to an event. And that event is not only the cross, but the culmination of the manifestation of what happened at the cross in A.D. 70. Everything Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24 related to, to the cross in A.D. 30-36 and with a climax in A.D. 70. So no matter when John died, no matter when John completed the book of Revelation, Jerusalem was destroyed, historically proven, uh, that uh, Titus, by Titus, a Roman emperor in AD 70. So during this long history of Jerusalem, I want you to listen to this, some of my closing thoughts today. Jerusalem had been attacked 52 times, captured and recaptured 44 times, uh, besieged 23 times and destroyed twice. Remember, Nehemiah built the walls of Jerusalem. And then now we have a, 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 AD 70 where the, 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 the Jerusalem is destroyed. In Revelation 11, 8, it seems to symbolize the destruction of Sodom and Egypt. They're spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified, which was in Jerusalem. Now, I know that in this lesson, we leave a lot of things unanswered, but we'll get to that in the next lesson as we continue to pursue verses 9 and 10 of Revelation 11. So uh, this is as this new covenant is emerging, uh, as it has and is emerging in us, 
and bringing healing and order to the create uh, chaos in God's creation. We're going to have to be a people who are willing to get things right, allow the dealings of the Lord in our own mind uh, of who Christ is, so that we'll not fall apart as God is working in us to bring about an end to some things. We saw that prophesied back in either chapter two or chapter three. So I, I've been asking this question, and now for 81 times, 80, 81st week of the teaching, this this uh, the 81st message. Uh, here's the question: Are you ready for what's next? The next thing that comes in you is the continuation of change from old mindsets of defeat into the mindsets of sons and daughters of God, which is the mind of Christ. Come on, the mind, the mind of Christ is in you, just like the finished work of Jesus. The mind of Christ is in you, even if you don't have a revelation of it yet. Listen, God has a new level of thinking for you, for his people, which is to start thinking like kings who operate out of a third heaven dimension. Praise the Lord. So stick with me on this journey as we continue to see more of the, the revelation of the unveiling of Christ in you, the hope of glory, so that we can discover what John found out as he stepped into the third heaven dimension, which changed him forever. Amen. You heard me talk about that, teach on that over these 81 weeks. And it's important we understand that because you say, but Dr. Bill, where are we right now? We are right now seated with Christ in the heavenly places and literally in the heavenly Christ. We already live and move and have our being in him. Amen. We're already positioned in heavenly places in the supernatural realms of God. Listen, folks, we're going to have to take on heaven's mindset right now in this life so that we can experience heaven on earth. Not the planet Earth, but the Earth of your humanity. Oh, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Well, listen, I hope you have a great day. Make sure you join me tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for Kingdom Dynamics. And Friday morning, we start healing school with Pastor Rory Sinegrand, Friday morning, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, if you would, like and share this video so that we can get more people involved in hearing the message of the revelation of Jesus. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a great day.